everyone. Uh, my name is Maria Gonima, and I am the founder of Big Smile Co., a marketing communications agency and Upstage Directory, which brings us here today for Upstage Talks. What is the Upstage Directory? Well, it is the world's first directory dedicated to diversifying all panels. We live in a world right now that is uh, you know, full of messaging and full of opportunities to speak, but some of us feel like we're not worthy or some of us feel like we don't know how. So we are here with some solutions. Very excited to have today uh, our panelists, Jocelyn Johnson and Francisco Gonima. It may sound familiar because he's in fact my brother, so I've known him my entire life. And Jocelyn, I've known more than a decade and absolutely am thrilled to have you both here. Again, the topic for today is around storytelling, uh, basically storytelling 101. And we will dig into all of the details of what it takes to make a story, all the things that you have to think about when you're presenting that story to an audience. And the two of these folks are wonderful experts in those spaces. Jocelyn, please introduce yourself. Thanks Maria for having me. I'm really excited to talk about this and, and talk about crafting story. My background from the point when I was a kid has always been a storyteller. It's actually a joke in my family that I was chatterbox and would get check marks in school for talking nonstop and telling people stories. So it's sort of innately in me to be a storyteller. It's no surprise that my career ended up being in PR communications and journalism where Really, I live and breathe storytelling. Um, this is also, I just realized as you were doing the introduction, a little bit of a funny uh, full circle moment for me because um, our eight-year-old is actually learning about storytelling right now and all of the different elements that go into nonfiction storytelling. So we've been writing a book. Um, we actually have two books that are due by the end of the week that are all focused on the structures of a story and how to break down your story and your book and how to craft that angle. So it's been kind of fun to see that play out from you know, my home all the way through to my career where I coach executives and companies on how to craft their stories and their messages for the media. And then also um, with you know, friends and colleagues and peers on their own personal stories and branding. So. This is going to be a really fun topic to dive that's into. Great, great. Uh, I can't wait to, I can't wait to read those. That's so exciting. I actually share some of the tips that are coming through. That's fantastic. <laughs> things to think about. I mean, we will, we'll cover them innately anyways, but yep. it's been nice to see that as a little bit of a reminder in elementary school, learning the arc of a story. That's awesome. And it all just, you know, you got to start with something. You got to start from the basics, uh, just an idea. So let's see how yeah. that, that grows. And then Francisco, who I think is, the person who taught me that you can get in front of an audience and talk, um, speak loudly and with a tale to tell. Um, so Francisco, please introduce yourself. Well, I'll tell you, you know, for me, like a lot of kids that grew up in the 80s, it all began with Star Wars. Uh, I'd say when, when I was growing up, uh, you know, I'm originally from Colombia and uh, immigrated to the United States as a kid and, and um, you know, I really had trouble kind of culturally adjusting and, and finding my way into kind of classic uh, American child culture uh, coming from Latin America. So I, I found my escape in Star Wars and, and you know, probably one of the most important uh, formative experiences for me was that as uh, our mom, as, as my mom kind of saw me in my own little world lost in Star Wars, she began to learn about um, George Lucas's uh, being influenced by the work of Joseph Campbell, you know, who wrote the the Hero with a Thousand Faces, and and so how Campbell had really um, mapped out the the archetypal arc of all classic mythological narratives globally, and and how really it was all Jungian archetypes, and how George Lucas had essentially taken uh, Campbell's monomyth structure and just laid a space western over it. Uh, and so um, my mom really introduced me to that and, and to that idea as a way to relate to uh, a lonely middle school son, right? And, and that became really the bridge for us. And, and um, you know, she didn't even know what she was starting because then that became the filter through which I, I kind of saw uh, the world, right? I really began to see the broader narratives of of the hero or the heroine and on their road of trials and who were the threshold guardians and what were the magic talismans and, and you know, what was the, uh, the seminal moment where they're battling the dragon on the mountaintop and then the journey home and, and really what it's about 
which is the discovering that the, the hero or heroine always had kind of the essential solution inside of them and it wasn't about any of the external trappings. And so, so that fascinated me as a kid, um, but then also coming back to the Star Wars piece, I, I really longed to live you know, a life of, of Luke Skywalker. Uh, and so professionally, I went uh, after college and, and went and spent a decade in disaster response and recovery uh, for the American Red Cross. I was a, a national disaster response officer. Um, and kind of at the, at the peak of my career with the Red Cross, I was head of shelter and feeding for the United States and its territories. And, and in that work, um, a lot of, uh, you know, what, what was at the core of my usefulness to the environments is that I wasn't, I, I was often not the subject matter expert in the room, but I could see the narratives, right? I could see the stories, the meanings that all of my colleagues were assigning to whatever it was that we were involved in, whether it was a very nerdy institutional administrative change uh, management project, or whether it was leading the state of Florida through the 2004 hurricane season when five hurricanes rolled over the state, you know, in six weeks. Uh, and, and in all those instances, when you can see the little thought bubble over people's heads of like, this is the story that they think is happening right now. And this is where they see themselves in the plot. And if you wanna be able to really connect, move, touch, inspire them to kind of redirect and channel their energies and their contributions, don't speak to the event, speak to the story, right? Connect with people at a level of story and, and really help them shape a narrative that they would be excited about, that they identify with, uh, and that, that really captivates them. And so then uh, 13 years ago, uh, I'll tell you, the disaster management life is rough. <laughs> so after a, a decade, I had done my part. And 13 years ago, I went into private practice and, and I've been in uh, public speaking, uh, uh, institutional coaching, individual executive coaching. And, and for 13 years then, it's been working with agencies, companies, community organizing groups, around really thoughtfully articulating the narrative of who they're trying to be in the world. And then not just doing that at an institutional level, but even doing that all the way down to the job level for frontline contributors, right? So that everybody on the team really sees themselves as part of an epic narrative. Everyone sees, you know, nobody wants to be C-3PO in the heroic story of their life. Everybody wants to be Ray, right? Everybody wants to be Luke. Everybody wants to be uh, Obi-Wan or Leia, right? So how do you help people really, not just at sort of the, uh, the PR and institutional level narrative, craft what it is that we're up to that, that's gonna change the world, but then at the individual contributor level, what is my part, the absence of which that mighty goal will not be achieved? Absolutely. I love how both of you um, are adept at bringing story into these structures. And I think that's really what it takes is, as you're saying, Francisco, having people understand that they too are part of the story, really engaging them. And so a core of that is understanding who your audience is. So one question uh, that I know is core to all of this before you even figure out the messaging, like you know what your story can be. You think about all the options, but you really have to look at the audience. How do you determine according to the audience who and how you want to structure your piece? From my perspective, the most important thing is to understand what not only just what your audience is, but what's going to resonate most with them. And it's not that you change your message in order to fit the audience necessarily, but it is that you change your delivery and maybe your angle or your, um, your entry point or your approach in communicating that story to them so that the story lands for, e for that particular audience. So if you're talking to a group of producers, that's going to be very different than talking to a group of distributors but you still might be talking about Carmen San Diego, right? So the converse, and you still might want to get the same three points across about Carmen San Diego. And you may want them to remember the essence of that brand and that show and that series. But the way that a producer is going to resonate with that is going to be very different than someone who's a distributor who's going to be thinking of reach and money and monetization versus creative and visual elements and pacing, like what we're gonna talk about today. So yep. I think 
just being very clear on who, who is listening, who's the, who are the recipients that may be in a mass audience perspective, you may be presenting to a larger group, it may go all the way down to the micro where you're thinking about a specific reporter, family member, um, the guy you're talking to at the gas station to help like give you a good deal or get your car done faster or something, right? Like you have to be thinking of, you know, what's your story arc? And when you really get good at this, you're, you start to innately sense your audience and then you can deliver the story to them in any context of your life. It doesn't matter if it's in a business context or like I said, at the gas station trying to like appeal to some guy to maybe rush a little bit or let you cut in line, you know? <laughs> I feel like you use this often, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Francisco? At the gas station, though. No <laughs> Good. Uh, All right. Old example that came through. Right? <laughs> No, I, I couldn't agree more, Jocelyn. And I think it's about how you curate your your delivery to lift up different notes, right? If we think about a beautiful piece of music, right? A, a, a beautiful piece of music that, that has lots of different instruments. A different arranger will uh, pick a, an arrangement of that piece that lifts up different notes, right? That, that the same piece of music in the hands of a different arranger Will, will be more forward on the strings or, or maybe more forward on percussion because they're trying to create a different experience. And, and similarly, in, in the work we do, right, if you're doing this at a professional level, you have, you know, you have a body of work that's the reason they invited you and, and they came, you know, they want you to share that body of work. But I think the difference between a storyteller and, and somebody that is essentially just delivering canned material is that ability to connect with the audience, right? Is that ability, um, you know, one of the things that I, I heard the beautiful story on, on uh, NPR a couple of years ago, where they were talking about uh, MRI uh, scans that had been done when master storytellers are doing their thing. And, and that, you know, the participants in the study had all been hooked, hooked up to MRIs. And as the, the master storyteller was spinning their yarn, within about two minutes, the, the wavelengths of everybody uh, participating in the study had synced up. It was crazy, right? And so from that standpoint, it's all about that connection. And so one of the things, you know, that I'll ask is, you know, we're, we're there um, at, the, at the behest of whoever invited us, right? So I always spend a lot of time on discovery. Um, you know, anytime I'm, I'm invited to, to speak with a group, I'll ask to do a minimum of three audience interviews, right? So who are three people that are going to be in the room or who are three people that are emblematic of who might be in the room? Uh, and let me spend a little bit of time with them so that I can really understand, you know, where are they at? Why do they think they're coming to listen to the talk, right? The sort of classic, what's in it for them, right? What's in it for me? So understand what was it that brought them there? And then that tells me how I work my arrangement, right? How I, how I work the mix on the soundboard to lift up the notes that allow them to connect with it as early as possible. And, and then kind of using what we know about how the adult brain learns, I'll always try and, and uh, kind of guarantee that we hook into them feeling like the story's about them, right? By, you know, I always make it a goal. Anytime I give a talk um, within, you know, the first two to three minutes, there's going to be a, have you ever had a time when question right? Relevant to whatever uh, I was asked to come in and talk about. And then I'll ask them to turn to a neighbor or to turn to two or three neighbors and just spend a quick minute before I've even launched into anything, right? Just anchoring with a neighbor an experience that they've had that, that resonates with that. And essentially, if we think about the brain as a, a computer's uh, file system, right? That process of inviting the person in the audience to connect with a neighbor about their own lived experience is essentially them clicking through uh, to open the file, right? And then hit record from an existing file. And so at that level, you're now speaking your story into a lived experience that they already have, so that now they're seeing themselves as the protagonist in your story. Even, you know, even if the story might be about your experience, they're experiencing it with them as protagonists. 
And, and that's what it's for, right? People don't come to hear your stories because they came to hear your story, right? They come to hear your stories because there's a hope that something in your story will resonate and reveal something about themselves that they hadn't previously tapped into. This is, a, I think, one of the techniques of, of grounding in a way, not only for you, the storyteller, but the audience. We talked earlier a little bit about the notion of grounding, but also surrender. You know, you're walking into a room, you're at odds with your own nerves and your own story that you're telling in your own head that's distracting from the story you're about to tell before this audience. What's the element of surrender and how do you prepare to tell your story? Because there has to be preparation. There's not a, a person, I don't think, who could just like walk in and be like, story, I got it, we're going. Um, you kind of have to really think about it. Again, all those things you're thinking about, the audience, are you sweating? Are you, do you look nervous? Are these people gonna come out with something that's really meaningful for them? Who's gonna relate to you? You know, you're thinking about all these things, there's too much happening, but how do you come up with the way that you will connect, that you will be grounded and be able to tell your story well in front of an audience? You know, I think that when it comes to your presentation, you're absolutely right that there's always going to be an element of preparation that needs to happen. Um, as part of that, I think rehearsing your key points and knowing like your power phrases, certain things that you want to get through to the audience in advance of going and delivering your presentation and really getting those committed to you, almost like your muscle memory, right? It's like when we're learning to ride a bike and they say that you can go back and you never forget how to ride a bike, it's largely because you've trained your brain and at a cellular level, you've got this muscle memory that just triggers how to ride a bike. So it's the same idea when you're doing your storytelling or when you're doing a presentation is what are my key moments and what are the key things I want to really nail and make sure I drive home? And then how can I rehearse those in a way that they become second nature and innately part of my being so that when I show up on stage, I don't have to get up into the thinking and the doing. I get to just surrender into that and know that I'm going to innately hit those points that I already have the information committed to my muscle memory. And ultimately the delivery may not be exact to your script. It may move around a little bit. Cause again, if you approach an audience and you say, how many producers do I have in the room versus how many distributors you can be agile in that moment and know that innately you'll tell the right arc and you'll be able to adjust and be agile to that audience. Um, and it's really just about letting go and surrendering and, and letting it happen. I mean, it's right. like Will Ferrell moment, right? It's an old school where he steps up to the podium and he gives his delivery and then he snaps out of it and he's like, what, ha what just happened? Like, I blacked out. Like, that happens to me every single time I speak. It's happening right now, I'm sure. Like, I'm going to get done with this and be like, Maria, like, what did I say? Did I look ridiculous up there? Like, did, you know, it's all happening and it's just noise that we're all going to experience. If we just surrender to that, let it go and just move through it. When you come out of the blackout, it's all fine. Right. And that really speaks to a lot of, you know, what everyone calls authenticity, which is truly overused, but such a beautiful word when you really put all the stock in it that it, it deserves. Authenticity is something that is not, not learned, not, it's truly something innate. And I think if you go into something knowing who you are and knowing yourself, then you can freely black out and uh, tell your best tale, I imagine. You Francisco, you have anything yeah. on that? <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, and linking to preparation with authenticity. I think that's where, you know, uh, uh, as, as we prepared for today, you know, one of my, one of my big tips for folks is, Forget about scripts, right? Forget about scripts. If you're if you are preparing for a stage production or you know a uh, you know kind of scripted uh, drama, yes, scripts are perfectly appropriate. But when you know up and until you are running for a national public office, right? People are more interested in your authenticity than in you having the the perfectly quotable line for the ages, right? They're they're coming to have an experience with you. And so uh, at a level of preparation, having, as, as Jocelyn said, your key ideas, you know, what I like to think about, what's your story architecture, right? That, that you really have the outline um, of, you know, that, that essentially, you know, you have your, your, your personal story at the beginning, and then you begin to kind of follow the, 
the classic uh, pastor's rule of, of groups of threes, right? So, so that behind your talk, you have three big ideas that you want to lift up. And then depending on time, you have three ideas inside of each big idea. And then if you're doing like a whole day seminar, then you got, you know, this fractal of threes and threes and threes and threes. Because uh, it's easier for folks to hold on to. But at a level of the authenticity piece, that's where you just begin to dance with the audience, right? And, and I think the, the speakers that I enjoy uh, being the audience for and the speaker that I try to be is one who's actually in an organic give and take with the audience, right? You might have your outline, but the notes that you lifted up and where you really dug in and spent the time were entirely fueled by where you saw a response in the audience, by where you saw people kind of giving the love back or, or really tuning in. You know, I, uh, I joke with, with my wife, who's, who's my, my coach and my, my corner man, you know, in the boxing ring and my, She's my in the audience, by number one audience. Yep. Yes, she is. Um, <laughs> but I always tell her, I know, I know that I did a good job when we get to a point, you know, about 10 or, or 15 minutes in, where I'll look out at a sea of faces and I'll deliver a key point and I'll, I'm looking at like 80 people who do this at the same time. Yeah, right, like everyone's having the like, I totally get that and that matches with my lived experience, right? That, and that's, you know, that's to me, I think one of the things too, I think a lot of, a lot of speakers, a lot of people that are trying to move into the world of, of intellectual property or ideas and things like that. They try too hard to sort of own the originality of a thought, right? But the most powerful ideas are the ones that, that are universal of the human experience, right? The, the most powerful ideas are the ones that are so commonsensical and so essential that in the busyness of life, we've forgotten them. And so to me, the speakers that move me are the ones that remind me Right? And that's where we go back to, to the Campbell stuff, right? Like Campbell's fundamental message, uh, or not his message, right? The message of all global mythologies that Campbell just articulated and revealed, right? Is that every individual always had that answer inside of them from the beginning, right? They just forgot it. They lost their grip on it. And so, so when you are authentically in a dance with the audience when yes you've got your talking points you've got your main messages but but you're really connecting and you're you're you know you're delivering fan service so to speak that as as you're seeing that parts of what you're sharing are more meaningful you're slowing down abandoning parts of your outline if you need to but to really give them what is landing right and 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 really serve that well um, because you want people walking out of your talk reminded that they are whole, complete, and perfect, right? Not that the speaker was whole, complete, and perfect. Absolutely. I think one of the most important things, you mentioned the rule of three. I think for a lot of people sort of new to speaking or that maybe don't want to be conscious and dialed into audience, they want to put it all in there. They want to make sure they hit every single point um, without structure. And so that requires editing. Um, Jocelyn, specifically, you work with a lot of executives who I'm sure are really keen to like, oh, but I want to say this, this, and this, because we've got to get that message in, even though, you know, you might have to tell them, well, that audience that you're trying to serve with that isn't in the room, but the people who are in the room are, are these. So these are the things that you want to hit on. How do you manage that type of communication with a client? Happened yesterday. <laughs> I have a really wonderfully fresh example of how this played out. So the client said to me, we're having this huge board meeting and I need to have this deck and this presentation done. And we were supposed to have our story arc ready um, by end of this week. And it got pushed up to, um, what day is today, Tuesday? Yeah, so it got pushed up to Monday. Today, Tuesday? It's Wednesday, it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> days. days. And, right? they, they all run together these days, right? <laughs> yeah, um, so, uh, so his presentation was actually yesterday, but we had to have it done by Monday instead. So he sends me this slide and he's like, my boss gave me feedback like that I don't understand. He's asking me like, what's the objective? What are we trying to get across? And it's everything on this page that we're trying to get across. And I looked at it and in a moment I said, okay, but there's three things that these all, all you have 15 points here. 
And there's three things that all of these 15 points fit under. Mm. One is scale. One is quality of content. One is da-da-da. Put all of the points that support those things under there. And it's like we nested. It was the same amount of information. He literally didn't have to delete. He didn't have to change the language. He didn't have to make any edits to what he was wanting to get across except for categorizing them in a way that was super clear and showed what our exact objectives were. We want the audience to walk away remembering that we've got scale and growth. We've got amazing content and that we're brand safe and like great for kids and family, you know? So it was like, in that moment, you don't have to worry about getting all the things across. If you can consolidate it down and then to Francisco's point that he made, have those you know, core topics and then have items nested underneath that that you want to hit as well, it becomes a lot less daunting and overwhelming to have to even remember to hit all the points because your body then all, all of a sudden is trying to only remember these three core categories and then underneath them, you already have all of the supporting elements that you, you know can prove those three points. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really about helping them um, simplify and, and consolidate down all the thoughts that they want to have into really concise, clear, and concrete information that the audience can remember um, and leave with a sense of feeling. You, I, I asked him, I said, what do you want these people to walk away remembering about this company? You know, if, if every single room, doesn't matter how you deliver it, doesn't remember who, what the agency is or what the client or what the partner is, what are the three things you want them to remember about you? And then mm -hmm. everything else supports that. The way you deliver it, everything else supports that. So I think it's just about remembering, remembering to remind them or reminding them that it's all about being clear and concise. And simple. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's great. I mean, I think those are, everyone needs to be reminded of that all the time. I think it's, you know, when you're making an outline or even thinking through something, you, you want to know that there's going to be a solution or someone's going to walk out of a room feeling or believing something and there's got to be a call to action and, and some response to it. Um, Francisco, in your work, and you mentioned it before, you have to tell stories or you have to help people tell stories that people will then live out. Um, what do you think is, is the difference between that type of interaction that's like, here's a one-time thing, I hope, I hope they walk out the room believing in this versus here's a story and I need everyone in this organization from, you know, the, the person that barely even works in these halls to the person that is running the show to believe and feel this messaging that I'm sharing with you. No, I, I love that. I, I think that's, you know, that's a question of, of uh, what we refer to as, as what's the reinforcement scaffolding right? That, that it's one thing if somebody is coming to a conference and they're listening to a keynote speaker um, that's, that's going to tell a one-time story and that story is going to touch you or inform you or whatever, like delightful. But if you're actually uh, thinking about how you use storytelling in the context of a campaign or storytelling in the context of a change management agenda, right? That, that our, our organization was focused on these things, the world changed, we're now pivoting and our primary service or our primary product is now moving to this, right? Um, what we know in, in the field of, of human performance is that you, you need about 90 days of consistent reinforcement for people's brains to finally trust, believe in, and make the pivot, right? So if you just give the speech to end all speeches with the most gripping human drama at the heart of it, that simply won't do it. Right? You have to actually take those outlines, take those key messages, and turn them into reinforcing and consistently reappearing sticky language that you know, the members of, of that audience, of that tribe that you're trying to really um, make inroads with, will continue to have what we refer to as incidental contact with. Right? Like, how do you make sure they keep bumping into those ideas? Right? And then how do you make sure that whatever leadership in, is involved in being the steward of the pivot is actually embracing and integrating that language, right? Because in essence, every time they hear that language, 
it's pinging the neural pathway, right? It's pinging the file in their brain and saying, oh, this is a real relevant thing. Here I am seeing it again, okay? And every time I see it, I'm nourishing and adding you know, fuel to that pathway, becoming stronger and wider and stronger and wider, turning it from a little deer trail into an autobahn in, in the person's mind. And that's where really the identity level transformation happens. Uh, you often see people that have an incredible story to tell and that are absolutely leading a worthy cause, a, a worthy pursuit, you know, rely on one big talk right? That one big day, you know, we see it depicted in movies where it's followed by the slow clap, right? Where everyone <laughs> stands up, they're crying, they're doing the slow clap. You did it, Johnny, you did it, right? But guess what? If after that slow clap, people didn't go back to their desks and have an email that said, you know, thank you, Johnny, for that incredible message. Here were the big ideas that, that we invite you to think about how does this show up in your work? Right? How do you create um, kind of small group level conversation circles where people can get a chance to kind of process the big ideas and say, this is why I believe that it's relevant or this is why I believe it's BS. But one way or the other, you're creating scaffoldings that ensure they interact with the concepts. Right? How are you working it into your HR processes? Right? Like, do if you've said, you know, say a popular idea or a popular practice is, is to have big corporate values initiatives, right? And say, these are going to be our core values. Well, guess what? If those core values aren't reflected in the same words in your performance management structures and in your employee review processes and things like that, it was just a lovely speech, right? So when you're talking about how you take great storytelling and use that to actually drive everyday practical behavioral and institutional change. If you don't have ways that those key messages show up in the landscape so that people bump into them on an ongoing basis in context, right? Like in the performance of their work or in pursuit of the objectives, then what we know about how the brain acquires, retains, and integrates information is that it will just run off uh, in time and you'll, you'll fail to really get that integration. To that point, I, you know, yeah. we see this play out in the media landscape all the time. I mean, you can watch any of the um, former presidents, current president, and you'll start to notice that they use key phrases repetitively over and over and over again. And everything that is wrapped around that key phrase could change. But what ends up happening is that the, it becomes a culture, a, a piece of the um, cultural fabric of the company, of the country, of your mini group, of your friend circle. Like if you start to utilize certain phrases over and over and over again, to, again to Francis, Francisco's point about the neural pathways, it reinforces that, validates it, and then it almost becomes part of the, that cultural tapestry within any group, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's really the power of language, the power of messaging, and the power of story. I always call it singing from the same hymn book when trying to explain to uh, uh, someone who I'm coaching through a, a story, you know, you want everyone to be repeating this and to really take it in. So if it's very long, you can't really do that. If it's yeah. brief and real and meaningful to not only you, but others, that will resonate. Um, and so both of you sort of talk through identity uh, and, and what that means. I want to dig into some top tips from you as we start wrapping up, but I know this was really important to all of us to talk about. You know, going back to the person that's going to watch this, that wants to go on a stage that feels like they're not, they're not there yet, or they're not good enough, or that they're not, you know, they don't have something that's valid or worthy to tell. How do we sort of walk someone out of that and help them identify who they are and why they matter and why they have a story? Um, just back to the very core roots of it, you know, before they can even get to that spotlight on them that's somewhat terrifying or before they walk in front of a room and try to imagine the audience naked. What is identity in, to the core of what we're trying to say here? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that one. I, I, I really believe that identity is everything. I, I think um, identity is the root of authenticity um, because essentially you're speaking 
not from a script, not even from an outline. You're speaking from the core of your being and something that, that you believe at your heart is of service to others, of service to the audience, and that's why you need to share it. And I think oftentimes people are poorly served because they try and, and work on mechanics and supporting tactics without getting their identity you know, kind of straight and clear. And you know, why am I in the room? What is, what is, it, what is it in my lived experience that obligates me to go share this good news, to go share this story with these folks. Um, because otherwise it feels like selling, right? Like you're not believing in the story, you're telling the story. But when you're just being the story, right? When you're recounting what your lived experience has taught you is true, that's when it really feels authentic. I'll, I'll give you an example. Yesterday, uh, I was on a, a Zoom with a, a new coaching client and we're just still getting to know each other. And, and this person is incredibly high performing, creative, works in the design field um, and, and is sort of on the cusp of moving into ownership uh, for the design practice that, that he's a part of. But part of the feedback that, that he's gotten is that he really, you know, in order to be a marquee partner that's gonna help grow the business, he's gotta be able to be out there uh, visibly as a thought leader and, and telling stories, right? And, and become somebody that's recognizable as a part of the firm for people to really see him viable as a partner. And he was saying, yeah, 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 I, you know, I, I know, I know, I need to just speak up more. I need to, you know, I just need to make myself say more things. And, and as we talked about it, you know, this was the conversation, right? Was what, you know, the work isn't create a little box in the upper right-hand corner of your notebook and keep chiming in on the conversation until you've collected seven hash marks, right? Like that, that level of tips and tricks isn't the issue because then you're gonna be the person, you know, uh, what was it that Mark Twain said? Better, uh, better to be, uh, you know, mis mistaken uh, for the, the fool that had nothing to say than to speak up and prove that you were the fool, right? That, that you know, in the, in the case of, of this fellow, I said like, you need to spend some time really digging into why did you pursue this design profession? What is it that moves you in the work? What is it in your design profession that, that you feel is missing from the world that every breath you take is the pursuit of adding this to the world? Like when you're really clear, you know, in, in his instance, it was the field of, of landscape architecture, right? High-end uh, landscape architecture. And so, you know, he had all this rich experience in, in anthropology and in environmental science and da, da, da. He said, man, when you get really clear about what it is that you were born into this earth to say about where, you know, the earth meets, you know, civilization and what it could be, that guy, when there's a conversation happening in the room that he's got something to offer, that guy will not be able to restrain himself from offering something thoughtful and valuable. But if you're trying to sort of fight your inner introvert and just chime in for the sake of chiming in, you'll actually kind of render yourself irrelevant, right? And, and I would say that's more harmful. So, so at that identity level, right, for me, it was the journey of, of being uh, a disaster response professional while trying to also balance, you know, who I was going to be as a whole and healthy person and who I was going to be as a parent, right? And, and, you know, how then do I make hard choices and live inside of those choices by, you know, uh, declining the, the route of institutional advancement and rather, you know, working uh, with smaller startup organizations and things like that. So, so that narrative um, is why I believe, and, and my, my clients tell me so, why the things that I try to offer them resonate and move, touch, and inspire them to consider different choices than the path that they were on, right? Because I am invested and believing in and living the advice that I'm giving them. Uh, I think the individual that has done all of kind of the technical formation, but is still muddy and foggy about what their emotional, historical, cultural core is, 
about being in that room, being in that situation, we'll just sort of throw spaghetti at the wall, you know, and some things might be useful and others won't be, but there will be a fundamental coherence that's missing that will leave the audience in doubt. Jocelyn? Yeah, I mean, I think what you're saying for about, about the human experience and really getting into your heart center of your story um, is an important starting point for sure. I also think there are um, three other things that I would re reference. Um, the first one would be that everyone has noise and everyone has noise about the, the validity of their story, maybe the value of their story, the impact that they'll have, there's always going to be some layer of noise that each person is going to be bringing to the table. That's also just part of the human experience. So I think it's about making peace with your noise and accepting that noise and recognizing you're going to, you can work through that and you don't have to bring it on stage or you don't have to bring it into the room with you. Even if you're presenting in your you know, office or you're presenting to a small group or you're, you know, approaching a, a story that is difficult for you in, in a family dynamic or something. I think it's about just like making peace with your noise and then being brave and stepping through that. Um, I think there's also the element of like, there's no new information. So, you know, everything that could, uh, could be said, it will, uh, it has already been said and you're just repackaging, you're giving it a new outerwear, right? An outerwear that can connect with people on a grander level because you're able to tap into a human experience that you've had. And there's a practice, um, this is the third thing that I think is just really useful. There's a practice in meditation called Tonglen meditation. And it essentially speaks to this point that your experience is not just your experience, the shared experience across everyone. So if you're experiencing crazy, crazy anger, or crazy, crazy anxiety, or crazy fear about speaking, you can start to think about all the people all around the world who are experiencing that exact same sensation at the moment and identify with what that's like. And then immediately it diffuses the, the energy around that. So I think if you're able to you know, go into that noise and think through, okay, how is this noise showing up for me? And then this is like a shared experience across the board with so many other people. And like, that is so tough. And what I'm experiencing is so tough, but I get the opportunity now to step through that and then deliver my story because at that moment, you've now dropped into your human experience and you know that what you have to share is shared with everyone in the room, right? Everyone in the room experiences fear. Everyone in the room here has some noise that they're dealing with. And by you dropping into that experience yourself, you're going to be able to speak in a way that helps them connect back into you and walk out of that room feeling, you know, like Francisco saying, really immersed back into what you just shared with them. I think to that point, we, you know, we all have a story. And I think that's, that's the main thing. That's the goal of Upstage is really to help people find their story get comfortable with it and share it. So we should be wrapping up. Um, I would love to ensure that you guys get your tips in and then we have a question. I don't know if you want to shoot off some tips or if you you know feel like you've already kind of covered them, but I would love to hear what you guys have to say. One quick tip that we had um, discussed in our prep that I don't know that we, um, well, we didn't get to it. So I'll just share it through here was a, a little bit about pacing mm -hmm. and um, going in and realizing, okay, I, was listening to the audience. I was picking up on their, um, you know, nonverbal cues about whether they were leaned in or whether they all picked up their cell phones at the same time, or whether I saw Jenny across the conference desk, like check out and start doodling. You start to pick up on those things and it impacts your pacing. So, um, one thing, one tip that we, you know, we discussed was having your, three areas that you want to cover, but knowing that you can slow down and spend a little bit more time on that and having one of those three that's axable. Yeah. I can cut this one out. I can abandon that because if it's, if these two core points are really resonating with the audience, I'm going to be in greater service to them by spending time on these first two and completely abandoning point three and having those other nested topics underneath that I can dig into and get juicy with rather than trying to force in these three things that you wanted to accomplish. So I think that's just a good tip to like, of your three, decide which one based on the room could be cut out. And uh, tagging off of that, 
everything that uh, Jocelyn said, which then links into how do you think about the way you're using visuals, props, other supporting materials, right? The more detailed your visuals are, the more you've painted yourself into a corner, mm -hmm. right? The more your hands are tied. That's why, you know, I've really enjoyed, I would say as a, you know, being, being in my, my mid to late forties, uh, I remember when a lot of presentations and talks were like PowerPoint text, heavy, 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 where it's like bullet, 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 bullet. And depending on what the content is, sometimes you need to do a little bit of that, right? But, but to Jocelyn's point, if you're telling a story and you need to abandon something, well, the problem is you've got seven more slides and how do you ditch that ballast now uh, to make room without creating awkwardness, right? Also too, as a tip or trick, I, would, I advise folks, don't share your presentations until after you've given the presentation, right? <laughs> Invariably, my best presentations, exactly to Jocelyn's point, are ones where I, you know, I really tuned into the audience and abandoned the parts that didn't feel as relevant once we got into the dance, right? And so if the audience, you know, has your deck ahead of time and they saw that you had like 10 things that you were gonna go through and you ended up only giving them seven, now, because of that, regardless of whether they enjoyed the heck out of your story, because of that, now they're like, oh, well, I just totally got shortchanged three, right? But, but if at the end you're able to then norm whatever your takeaway is to how you actually, you know, how the jam session played out, right? They're like, this was delightful, right? That, that you know, I think what happens is people uh, that love storytelling often love detail and love the richness of detail but that can prompt us to be unduly OCD with our material. And we can get too emotionally attached to things that might generically have been important, but in this instance of delivery, that wasn't where the energy was. And so the ability to let it go. So, so in terms of the, the tips and tricks, you know, I'm, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm always a big fan of discovery in my experience you know, taking the time to have a few conversations before any delivery to really understand why, you know, a representative uh, cross-section of folks that were coming to the room think they're coming to the room so that you can make sure that whatever story you're coming to tell is arranged to lift up the notes that really hit what they believe they came for. So they feel like they were well served and they were at the center of the story. Um, number two, right, being really clear about how you know your identity matches with that audience so there there are times you know i think uh, there's a temptation especially when you're you're in the work as a as a paid public speaker there might be a temptation that you know any any gig that pays is a good gig but i think that's a mistake right there there have been opportunities where somebody uh, came to me through a referral and and they heard that i was good but then once they really laid out who their audience was what the context and purpose of the convening was like you know, I don't think I'm your guy. Um, it sounds like what you're up to is much more in Jocelyn's wheelhouse. Let me make an introduction, right? And, and, and how do you really make sure that you're being, you know, fully aligned with whatever audience you're coming to speak with so that, you know, you're, you're really uh, uh, working off it. Now, what you said, Maria, I think the, the singing from the same hymnal, right? Like what a great analogy if that is gonna work, you have to actually give people a hymnal, right? Like that's, that's a great example of the supporting scaffoldings and reinforcing structures that we we're talking about, right? That get clear before the delivery, what are gonna be the key messages that the client is really trying to drive home? And I think one thing too that, that we haven't talked a lot about, but that I, I really believe in is, you know, how can you anchor into, uh, key messages that the client uh, or that the audience has already been working on, right? So I, I think this is a real um, distinction in professional storytellers, uh, uh, you know, sort of professional paid public speakers is some people are really coming to sell their intellectual property, right? They're coming to sell their books, sell their IP. And so they, they're trying to distinguish their language and their ideas so that they're really strengthening the IP. But the dilemma is if the, if the goal is to come in uh, and nourish, root, 
and strengthen what a company, what an agency, what a community is already up to, then essentially you're giving them a distraction, right? You're, you're pulling their minds away from the thing that you were brought in to really nourish. So I really, I ask folks to give me their corporate value statements. I ask folks, you know, to give me what are their big strategic agendas. And I try and pull language from the canon of what that group is already committed to and working on so that I can actually be a reinforcing structure to the things that they were already. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like trying, to, cat, I'm cats, trying to get Cooper out of here, but. The cat has appeared. So, <laughs> so I think that's, that's the stuff. Bottom line, it's about the audience um, and, and understanding what they came here for and what they need to get out of it. Uh, and then making sure that you're aligned with that not about making yourself as, as the speaker, the center of attention. We have, have some fantastic, oh, ah, sorry. sorry. We have some fantastic sorry. questions that I'd love to get to. I think it's gonna tie into one of the questions that I see on this um, yeah. item, which is um, let go of perfect. The audience doesn't know what they don't know. So if you're making, you've seen these speakers, right? Um, and you can identify the true performers who make a mistake and just keep rolling. They don't call it out like, oh, oops, I was supposed to go on that slide. Or like um, I was, we, I'm working with a client right now called Live by Live and they had this performer and she got chained to her, she was doing a live stream performance and she was actually like performing like an arena style performance, dance routines and changing outfits. And halfway through the performance, she was in this chained outfit and got stuck to her stool. And a guy like rushed on camera and like helped her unchain herself from her stool. And she kept performing through the whole thing. But can you imagine how that would have impacted the viewing experience if she had said, oh, I'm stuck to my stool. Hold on, I'm gonna restart my song. You know, it, it just like is interruptive. And the fact that she went through that was humanizing and also just like a testament to her ability as a performer. And I think when you're a speaker, if you blow past five of your points, they don't know what they don't know. Yeah. You don't have to yeah. stop and be like, oh, I was supposed to tell you guys about cats. I forgot about that. There <laughs> <laughs> um, was a great analogy I had ready for you and I spaced it out. And so let me roll back and tell you that now. Cause you know, they don't know. They're not gonna ever know what yeah. you missed and they're not gonna be looking for perfect because whatever you give them is going to look as perfect as they thought it could have been. Yeah. You know, they don't know what was on the paper. Yeah. So um, this question was about like what, when you're bombing as a speaker, um, what are your coaching tips for getting back on track? I think um, it's a little bit of a pacing question. There is no reason you can't stop and take a breath. This is the same thing when you're doing an on-camera interview. If you don't know the answer, rather than filling the time with a bunch of words that make no sense and make you look uncomfortable, take a breath. Give yourself a quick moment to just reframe get out of your head and move on right it's like don't linger and don't just try to fill the space if you need to take a breath collect your thoughts be like i'm fucking this up but i'm gonna reset what am i gonna reset with and let's go back into this for all they know it's an intentional yeah. cliffhanger they don't know <laughs> that you're not doing that on purpose to let them like be like what's gonna happen now and then Boom, you've recalibrated your entire energy field and you, they never knew that you were like in your head saying, I'm screwing up, I'm screwing up, I'm really bombing right now because you were able to take a breath, reset, and change your entire context right then. Yeah. That'd be my advice. And, and I would, uh, to, to add to that, uh, Alyssa, to your question, I would also say, make great use you know we know with adult learning that people learn more past the age of 25 people learn more by referencing lived experience than they do by acquiring new content so if i'm you know as a good practice anyway a great presenter is regularly having people process some key piece of information with a neighbor right when I am bombing, when I'm having a tough moment, or as, as Jocelyn said, when I've lost the thread of my own notes and I need a minute to get it together, I'll say to the group, have you ever had that experience? Uh, take two minutes to, to just share that story with your neighbor, right? And for them, it's engaging. They don't know that you're like, oh my God, I forgot the entire back half of my presentation. 
right? So you can always say, hey, you know, I, I've had that happen to me too. Have you? Everybody, let's, why don't we take two minutes to share with a neighbor, right? I, I've always been moved by, by something I learned from one of my mentors. Between you and me, the answer's in the room, right? I think it's a mistake when the storyteller or the presenter believes that they need to single-handedly be the answer to everything, right? So when there's a question, turning people toward the wellspring of lived experience, sitting next to them is a perfectly great redirect rather than uh, positioning yourself as the great and powerful Oz. Generally, I want to be the great and powerful Oz, but <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of squirrels in here trying to take over. All right, um, Lacey, we've got some questions. So uh, two very timely questions. One, a lot of people right now are probably looking for work. So how might you take some of these lessons and apply them specifically to the job application and interview process? And then secondly, for you, Francisco, based on your, your background in crisis management, how are you seeing storytelling and narrative affecting the response efforts for coronavirus? So obviously your resume is your resume. You have your bullet points down of you know, all your credentials and achievements to date. When you're going into an interview, it's no different than going into speaking to a room, speaking to um, a small group, a large group, to a single person. What are the three things you want that job or that recruiter or that interviewer to remember about you when you left the room? I would say make sure that one of those three points is something that's very humanizing and not just about what's on that paper, that resume, right? It's like, what are, what are the qualities that you possess that are so unique to you, you special butterfly, unicorn butterfly, that they, you want them to remember when they walk out? What's your essence? That's what needs to come across in that room, L not even including the things that are bullet pointed on your resume, on your piece of paper. They already have that. So they need to be able to walk away with what are the three core things that they would say about Jocelyn when she leaves that room? Like, what are the three things I want everyone who's watching this right now to walk away knowing about me? I've revealed a lot of different things about myself throughout this time, even though I haven't said, I meditate, or I study this, or I feel that. They came across in the ways that I opened up my vulnerability and shared with you from a human experience. So I would say just keep that in mind as well. What are the three things? What's the deep essence that you would want them to walk away? Because ultimately that's why they'll hire you, not just what's on the paper. Well, I was just going to add, um, also thinking about how your three points relate to the job description itself. Um, the more you can tie back to the job description um, and tell the story that you were prepared, that you thought really thoroughly about how you relate to this job, um, and you built a story about what you will mean in that role. Um, it is, you know, we, we all dream, we all want to dream big, and you are in that room because you dream to be in that role. Um, so explain that dream and, and make your story tie to theirs. You know, from that standpoint, what I was going to say is we actually, um, we retain information and we remember people in the form of their stories. So the ability to take the three things that Jocelyn was talking about and then weave it into a narrative, right? Your narrative that culminates uh, in, in that dream. Um, you know, Meryl, as, as you posed the question, I'll tell you, as a coach, I'm often uh, uh, consulting with clients on major hires. And when we're talking about and sort of tracking finalists and promising candidates, essentially we refer to them not by name, but by the story that we remember from their uh, application process. We're like, you remember the, the Peace Corps lady? Yeah, or, or what about the Microsoft guy, right? Like, so, so the story that we remember from the interview actually becomes their sort of working title. And so if you came in and gave a rigorous, tell, you know, gave a rigorous telling of your professional uh, credentials, but you didn't leave them with any of a story for them to hold on to and use when they're talking about you later, they're probably not going to remember you as, as qualified as you might be. Now, pivoting, I know we're over the time. So, uh, Michael, to your question on the crisis management, um, here's what we knew before Corona. Disaster relief is entirely a cultural and psychological event. 
right? That, that when we, in the, in the profession of disaster response, when we think about disaster relief, it's about taking a, an individual and a set of individuals who have been affected by a traumatic event that was not their doing, right? And that event has dislocated what's called their locus of control, right? Their psychological belief that they're in control of their own destiny, right? It's, it's the source of our empowerment. So everything that we do in uh, disaster relief is not just solving the practical and life safety and asset protection problems that the disaster has induced, but actually reconnect, you know, I call it reconnecting people with their little golden ball, right? Restoring people's sense that, that they have control. That's why when we look at some of the advice, you know, that, that some of them are, are more reputable sources like uh, CDC and Dr. Fauci and others uh, have given us, what's so powerful is that they're trying to give us criteria, not just we'll tell you when it's safe, right? That's bad disaster relief because in essence, you've kept the future as a black box that only the anointed have any insight into. And so what that does is that actually perpetuates a feeling of dependence and helplessness and, and actually gives more rise to kind of panic responses and unsafe responses, which I think we're seeing a lot of. But when you give people a criteria set, right, an objective universal criteria set that says, these are the benchmarks that we're going to look to. What that does is that liberates you or I to go to reputable sources and see the data for ourselves and then be able to make predictions about, oh, okay, so that means maybe, maybe five months from now, I can go on that family vacation, right? Um, or no, the numbers don't suggest that at all. Honey, let's cancel the tickets, right? So, so that narrative and giving people reference points and handholds so that they can start to believe that they have the ability to make predictions about their own future and start making choices then within those predictions, that's what restores their sense of relief, right? And we use the, the technical and material forms of uh, disaster and emergency response to, to keep the body safe, right? But relief doesn't come until the individual feels like they can start planning for their own future within their own judgment. We are so super grateful for your time and for all of you who joined us. Thank you so much for talking through Storytelling 101. Next week, May 20th, we have a talk on reaching the right audience and digital strategies. We have two very fantastic speakers there. This, in fact, makes me think that we should do a crisis management like response chat Let's do as it. well. Let's do it. <laughs> um, and I think both of you would be wonderful speakers to that too. We'll just have to figure it out. But um, thank you. Thank you so, so much. You know, everyone stay tuned for more from Upstage Directory. Bye guys. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone.